right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this special Q&A panel. I'm Kevin Polly. I will be hosting this Q&A panel. And yes, if I could go back in time and tell 80s me that I'd be dressed up as a Ghostbuster sitting with Robbie Freeling and uh, Billy Peltzer, I'd be kind of freaked out. This is awesome. Zach, Audrey, thank you so much for joining us today. We're so glad to have you up. Pleasure to be here. Well, we're going to open up the questions to the audience. Now, I have plenty of questions I can hit these guys with all day, but we wanted to give you all a chance to ask questions that you might have about the films that they've worked on. If they are... Uh, Again, whatever you would like to hit them with, they will be happy to uh, do their best to answer. So, do we have any questions out here to get things going? Please come up to the microphone here in the middle and ask your question. Don't be a stranger. My question is, is this working? Yes. It's, 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 it is it's working. It's working. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to make sure you can hear what we say. Is yours working? Oliver? I think mine is definitely working. There you go. Wow. Excellent. I can hear my so, voice. Excellent. Don't be afraid. Come up, ask questions. I mean, we got a mogwai sitting right now. Come on. It's like a sixth question. grade dance. Someone has to get out on the dance floor, and then once a person gets out on the dance floor, everybody else comes out and starts dancing, too. All right. Here's our first question. There we go. Okay. So, you can't see the Grimmels after midnight. When is it safe to feed them? And, oh, I'm sorry, the mogwai. When is it safe to feed them again? Is it sunrise? Is it noon? When is it... Uh -oh. You know, the uh, we actually make fun of this a lot in Gremlins too. Um, you know, they, there's the line where he says, if Gizmo gets a caraway seed stuck in his teeth and he goes across the international date line, <laughs> when, is it, when is it permissible for him to eat? I mean, here's the thing. Chris Columbus wanted to make very short, concise rules. So, you know, don't expose him to bright light. Don't get him wet. And then never ever feed them between 12:24 and 4:57. It just doesn't work. <laughs> so what they he came was don't feed them after midnight. Now of course the interesting thing is it's always technically after some midnight, right? Right now it's after last midnight. That's right. So that's what makes it so great, and why I'm not really that dumb when I break the rules. Because how do you not break that rule? I mean, it's pretty much guaranteed to be. That's to be definitely broken. not his fault. Not his fault. Now, you know, one question while I'm thinking about it, I had a chance to look at an earlier draft of Gremlins, and it's such a, like, a much darker tone of a draft. When you came on board for the film, was it starting to take the shape of the film that you ended up making, or was it still kind of in that darker tone? Uh, well, one of the things that people are kind of stunned to hear is that I, when I auditioned for Gremlins, um, they only gave us about two or three pages of the script to audition with because they wanted to keep it nice and secretive. So the only thing when I auditioned that I had read was the, the walk home with Phoebe Cates scene where she talks about how she doesn't really like Christmas and, and that, that kind of a thing, leading up to when I ask her out on a date. So that's all I knew of the movie. So I read the scene with her. We actually got paired together, which obviously was pretty helpful since we got cast together. And uh, when I was done, they called and they offered me the movie, and I was like, well, that's great, can I read the script? And they were like, no. <laughs> and I was like, what, what do you mean, no? You're offering the movie, I want to you know, see what I'm doing, I want to see what I'm playing. You know, am I playing a hairdresser? I mean, you know, I didn't even know, who I, what, what am I doing? They're like, you cannot read the script until you agree to do the movie. Wow. <laughs> Which is kind of amazing. And I said, um, let me think about it. Unknown actor, lead to Spielberg movie, he just did E.T., I'll do the movie. <laughs> so I agreed to do the movie basically blind, having no idea with what I signed up for. I, all I knew was that it was called Gremlins. So I signed up for it, and then I read the script, and I was like, oh, cool, I get to do this, and oh, they jump in a swimming pool, and oh, I get to blow up the movie theater. Sorry, spoiler. <laughs> Too soon. Um, and I think you're so, at this point. Yeah, so I basically found out what I was going to do after I signed up to do the movie. I, I'm not sure I've ever heard of anybody else, actor, any other actor that's ever had to do that. Have you? That, oh, actually, I did that too, and I think that is that is Spielberg's mode of operandi. He keeps something very secret because in Hollywood, things actually do get so and believe it or not, they're not that moral ethical in the entertainment industry. No. I know that's news. I know that's news to everyone. So he'll actually change the names of films, like E.T. was originally called A Boy's Life. And when I did Poltergeist, I hadn't even read the script when I agreed to do it too. We just got a couple pages, it was a breakfast scene in the movie where I'm talking about like how the ceiling fell on my bed. And I didn't even know what that meant. So basically <laughs> we had to agree to do the film before I even got the script as well. Wow. So that, that's basically standard operating procedure, but you know if Steven's involved, 
you know it's going to be awesome. And as a kid, I was just so excited. My parents were overwhelmed with the fact that I was working with the, the guy who had made Jaws and Close Encounters. And they, they loved this filmmaking there. So, so I was definitely on board even before I had even looked at the script. That's amazing. Any other questions out there, folks? Seriously, come up to the microphone. There is, there is no like, you know, there's no electro shock or anything like that. Come on up, man. Come on up. By the way, here's a little fun fact. The the working title for uh, Gremlins 2, just to confuse people when we were shooting, so they wouldn't know we were shooting Gremlins 2, was Monolith. <laughs> so they would say, "What are you shooting?" And it would say, "Monolith." monolith. And then monolith. there'd be me and Phoebe and a bunch of people coming out of trucks with Gremlins, and people would be like. <laughs> It doesn't look like monolith to me. It's a pseudo sequel to 2001. It'll work. Yeah. Just trust me. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Hey. Uh, how you guys doing? Um, my question is for Oliver. I kind of talked to him a little bit, but um, as a as a fan of Toby Hooper, it's always been frustrating that there's not like a commentary track for Poltergeist. And uh, so I was just wondering if you could talk about what it's like being directed by Toby Hooper, because everyone always talks about it, like Steven uh, Spielberg being the producer, but Toby Hooper. You know, this is this is my experience with Toby. Um, I was I almost had no experience as a child acting. I, I prior to the Poltergeist, I had basically done two commercials. I'd done a fertilizer ad. I know that's very Shakespearean, and I'd done a, a Royal Oak charcoal commercial, which the charcoal didn't actually work. But that's another story. So I had zero experience, and I was incredibly nervous. So Toby was a fantastic director to have around because he was very quiet, very subdued, and very calm. And I needed all those things because I was a really nervous kid. And I really, you know, honestly wasn't that great of an actor. But what I, what I was good at was being myself and being natural. But I needed a certain environment for that to happen. So if I had a director that was on top of me, who bullied me or screamed at me, I don't know what would have happened with the production of the movie. I might have been even fired. So Toby really was a quiet kind of guy. He didn't really say a lot of things. But what he did say was so important. And the crew really listened to him and they believed in him. And, you know, that's one of the most important things on a film is that, you know, the helm of the movie, people have to listen to them and follow the directions. And they really did with Toby, too, because they loved his work. They knew what he had done before. And when Toby told me to do something or guided my performance, I listened to him. And for the most part, he let me do what I wanted because I was that kid. I became the kid. I was Robbie Freeland. So if something wasn't quite working, he would basically tell me, but in a very kind, gentle kind of way, too. And he kind of let me discover the role on my own. He never said, do this, this, and this. He says, be a kid. What would you do in this scene? Would you, how would you play with your food? What toys would you play with? And they actually let me bring a lot of my own toys to the set. And much of that dialogue, I actually just made up. We just, that was a very, that was a set, he was really into improv. And, you know, I was really spoiled in that movie because, you know, a lot of directors do not let you do improv. They're very specific. And what, how, you're going to walk four feet, you're going to hit the mark, you're going to turn right, the camera's going to dolly across, and you're going to say your line. And it becomes kind of robotic. While with Toby, he kind of let me just be a kid and act with Heather and Joe Beth, and we were, that's why it looks so organic and real, because of those scenes, because they are very real. Awesome. All right, we got another question coming up here. What was the funniest moment you had? Guys, I'm sure with both of your sets that you've worked on, what were the funniest moments you've had on, on the films that you've worked on? I don't know. <laughs> I would say, you know, it's funny. Um, Toby had this, had this, I would say addiction, but he had this thing that he loved these lemons, these cut off lemons with a Chinese plum, a dry Chinese plum. And I know it's gonna sound crazy, but they're like amazingly delicious and highly addictive. You put the Chinese dried plum in the center of these lemons. So, you know, initially, like Joe Bath and I said, can I try that? And we started trying them, and, and we tried, and we loved it, and it was delicious. So picture now 80 people with lemons cut off, a half of a lemon with a Chinese plum licking them, like they're like Sundays. But picture an entire crew, and it was the most ridiculous visual thing to basically see 100 people with lemon hats licking them on set, too. And this is like we're trying to make this serious movie. So it's a scary I mean, film, yeah. Yeah, a scary film. And that was like one of the funniest moments I probably ever saw. You really have to be there before to see that kind of thing. I have no idea. <laughs> funny? I, you, both of the Gremlins movies were kind of funny, but they were sort of stressful. Oh, I, I mean, uh, filmmaking's war. <laughs> we, we, it, well, it can't. It certainly can be. 
especially if you're on location and outdoors for long periods of time, then it can really be a war. But no, the thing with both Gremlins movies were just kind of, they were a lot of fun, but they were pretty relentless grinds. I mean, each one was at least four or five months long, and you're working five hour days, 14 hours a day, um, and then after the human and gremlin parts were done, they would have only gremlin parts, like the bar scene, where you just have pure special effects, for an additional four and a half to five months. So you're talking for Gremlins 1 about a 10 month shoot, and Gremlins 2 is almost a year long shoot. So by the time Joe Dante was done, everybody was just ground into a pulp and completely crispy fried. I remember visiting the set one time, like months after I had finished shooting, and I was just like, hey, you know what, if I Warner Brothers, all, I know they're still shooting, I'll stop by. And it was right near the end, and everybody was just so grumpy and grouchy, and I was like, hey, how's everyone doing? And everyone's like, what are you doing here? Get lost. We don't like you anymore. <laughs> they were so over it. I mean, it's like so much fun the first month, by month number 10 or 11, you're like, if I ever look at a gremlin again, I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> so, I mean, the whole thing was kind of fun. I, I didn't really find anything really super amusing. Yeah. Well, what you're doing with, in the, both of you, in, in the situations you had, you had two very big visual effects heavy films. Um, you know, Robbie, the, the Robbie Freeling situation there, you've got the clown, you've got the tree, you've got all the special effects that are done after that. With with Billy Pelcher, of course, you've got all of the remote the remote characters, the puppets, the remote control stuff. Talk a little bit about that, because I mean that really has to be, as an actor, that, that's gotta be a weird place to be, man. Zach, you're starting Actually I just remembered the funniest thing I actually just remembered. The the really funny stuff we had was on the first Gremlins when it was me and Phoebe and Judge Reinhold. Oh wow. Who was in uh, who played Gerald, whose part kinda got trimmed down pretty savagely. Um, luckily, in, in, in the Gremlins DVD, they re re restored some of the deleted scenes, especially one of my favorite scenes where Phoebe and I find Gerald has locked himself in the bank vault because he's, he's mentally snapped and gone crazy. If you haven't seen that, you should go, and, go and watch man. that. But what was the next question? Yeah, just looking at when you're working on a visual effects heavy film like that, and especially yeah. like in, in, with you with Gremlins, you know, yes. they're creating technology on the spot with these puppets. Yes. You talk a bit about that from an acting standpoint. You're also having to come up with you know, the character motivations and relationships with the characters, but then you've got all of this extra visual effects stuff that you've got to worry about too. You know, talk about that process. Well, you know, I was 19, I wasn't really thinking too much in terms of process, you know, the way that you kind of do as you're a more, more mature actor. But, I mean, basically, the key thing for me was I was head to toe in wires. Right, yeah. You know, I just wires going underneath all of my clothes, dozens of them. And every time that they would work the gizmo, which I would be holding in my hand, the wires would kind of pinch my flesh on various parts of my body. <laughs> Running all the way down from my ankle, oh up through my torso, up to, you know, my hands. And uh, so basically my process was trying to ignore the fact that sensitive parts of my body were being caught in cables <laughs> every day. And electrified. So it was basically trying to ignore what was happening and pretend that you're having a great time with this cute little thing. Which of course isn't, you know, at the time it wasn't talking. You know, in, in the movie it's talking and cute. But when I'm working with it, it's basically going <laughs> And you know, opening its mouth and saying nothing. So. You just had to kind of jump in there and pretend that it was a real creature, which wasn't that difficult because it's a pretty, even today, I think yeah, it's a pretty, pretty amazing effect. And, you know, it's funny because the guy who created Gizmo, Chris Whalers, when we were doing it at the time was, and I'm not exaggerating, close to suicidal because he thought it was, he thought Gizmo was terrible. He thought it wasn't going to work, that people weren't going to be convinced by it and that it was, the movie was going to be a big bomb and it was going to ruin his career and he was only 27, 28 years old and he was going to be finished. Um, of course, as it turned out, it was the absolute highlight of his career and made him an incredibly wealthy man and is one of probably what he's best known for. So he probably never realized that he'd peak at 28 <laughs> rather than the opposite. You're right, right. Oh, I'm getting a call. Oh, sorry. <laughs> So I basically had the same kind of experience. It's probably an opposite end of the spectrum, but we were just I was just told to be afraid all the time. And none of the effects you basically see in Poltergeist 
are real. And on set, we asked, I asked Toby, I said, what are we actually looking at here? I mean, what is the ghost going to look like? And he said, we have no idea, but it's the scariest thing you could possibly think of. So that's what you should be thinking of. So off camera, they'd be waving sticks, and they said, just watch the stick. That's where the ghost is in here. You're horribly terrified. And I'm like, okay, I, I get it. You know, that's what we have to do. So, in a, you know, as a kid, um, how I got the part, which was really interesting. They wouldn't tell me anything about the movie at all, but they, they wanted to get someone who's as close to Robbie Freeling in real life as they could find. And I was a kid because they asked certain questions. They said, okay, Oliver, like, what are you afraid of? And I said, I, I talked to this clown doll in my house. And I said, I'm terrified of that. And I, I'm afraid of this, this tree outside my house. So oh my God, and they said, you are the guy. So they said, just, <laughs> just tap into all those fears and everything else that you have and just remember that and, and emote, you know? And I was like, okay, I wasn't really, I didn't really know what acting really was, but I did know how to be afraid because I was kind of an expert at that already because I, I'd been afraid of so many things in my life up until that point. So, you know, like the tree scene, for instance, that scene was actually more tedious than really anything else because it was shot, that sequence maybe on screen is maybe 40 seconds long, it took two weeks to shoot and they had multiple trees and they, you know, they, when the arms come in, they said, now we want you to hop on the arms, but pretend like you're trying to stay away from the arms. <laughs> so they try to they try to break everything in down so a four or a 10 year old could pretty much understand it. And for me, it was always a challenge. Every day was a new challenge in that movie. Like the clown doll scene, we, that was, we were, so that's so terrifying. But the way that scene was actually done is they used the reverse camera, it wasn't CGI at all. So I actually had to act backwards. So they said, Oliver, we want you to start, pull the arm away from you, act like it's actually choking you, but we want you to be incredibly terrified to start, and then go back to being normal, because we're gonna do it, we're gonna reverse the camera and play it forward. And I'm like, okay, I got it. So every day was like another, another kind of weird, interesting kind of challenge, you know, that they told you. And it's a 10 year old kid, I was like, yeah, let's go for it, let's do it. And it's amazing when you look at that scene, and it's like nightmare fuel in a bottle. Uh, that clown is. We have a question up front here, please ask away. Well, when I did Voyager, um, the simplest thing that they did was that they found a location that looked very futuristic. So we actually shot that episode of Voyager in a sewage treatment plant in Los Angeles. <laughs> nice. So you can't tell because film is a visual medium as opposed to an olfactory medium. <laughs> but that set smelled pretty terrible. Oh my. So it's kind of amazing that all the actors aren't going like this. Welcome to so oh my god. <laughs> Woo! So yeah, it was it was it was definitely the stinkiest location I'd ever been on. But it looked really cool. Um, probably the most disappointing thing in my entire career was that I got on Star Trek Voyager because I wanted to beam up. Oh. I wanted to beam up to the star. I wanted to beam up so badly when I was a kid. All I wanted to do was be disintegrated into a tons of little particles and then reintegrated on the transporter thing. I wanted that so bad. So finally I got this episode. And not only do I get a Vulcan neck pinch, but then after I get the Vulcan neck pinch, they grab onto me and Robert Beltran says, three to beam up, four to beam up, however many of us there were. And I got to beam up and I was like, so excited. I'm gonna beam up. So they, I go, okay, so how do we do this? You know, because I figured this would be this real elaborate process. I go, okay, so here's what happened. Robert's gonna grab you, and you're gonna freeze. He's gonna say, three to beam up, you're gonna freeze. And I go, okay, cool, I got it. So they go, action. And he goes, three to beam up, and freeze. And now everyone run five feet to the left. <laughs> and so I ran five feet to the left. They go, that's it, cut, moving on. <laughs> That's a freeze and run five feet to the left? Well, why aren't I being disassembled and reassembled over there? That's the whole point of being on the episode. But that's all it was. You just went like this, and then you went like You can have some candy on it. That's how you beamed up. And I was like, wow. And sit down here. But it was fun being on the show. Everyone was great on the show. And 
cast and crew I'm still friends with Garrett uh, sure, Wang and me. Robert Duncan McNeil and a bunch of the guys on the show. So it was a fun, it was a really fun show to do. Definitely a great cast. Too. Although I did not get to work with Jerry Ryan, so I was like, oh. no Jerry Ryan. What is the point of doing Voyager? No Jerry Ryan. So I actually <laughs> saw her at Fan Expo Canada in 2014, and I was like, I'm so sad. I didn't get to work with you. <laughs> She's like, come here, sweetheart. We take a picture together. So it's on my Instagram. <laughs> And I'm like this, in the picture I'm like this. The little emoji with the two hearts in the eyes. Where you're like, bang, bang, bang. Any other questions we got, folks? Seriously, come on up. They are happy to answer your questions. You and the wizard hat back there, you look like you might have one. You have a question? Come on up. Come on, Harry Potter. You got it, come on, you got it. Take out that wand, give us your magic. Yes, sir. So, um, you weeks ago, um, it was the uh, 50th anniversary of uh, all those Star, Star Trek. Right, all Star Trek, that's right. And uh, I have uh, 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 um, right, right. And uh, um, I William Shatner? Shatner? Yeah. And, um, but I see him. Sorry, man. But I see him on film. But it, it was good. And parts of the scene. And, uh, and I make it on the film. Yeah. Wait, that's, a big fan of that's a good thing. That's a very good reason. It's outstanding. So, now, did you have a particular question? Do you want, did you want to ask about Or is that just a statement? Oh, that's a uh, uh, question. Okay. Uh, and, <laughs> and I do Oh yeah, he's got, he's got a very uh, very prolific career. And then uh, he's like, oh my god. You are bothered up. He did the first, yes. yes. And uh, Harry Potter first too. He did the first two, I believe, yes. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, when you say that scene in the cover, uh, the funeral, you did that for the first job. Oh yeah, that's that's my favorite movie of all time, so you're, you're appreciating the choir there. Well, let's say what. Let's look at this. Now, you, you had the chance to work with Chris Columbus. What What was he like as a director? Because it was still pretty young in his career. Well, he wasn't a, the director on Gremlins. He just wrote the screenplay. It was a screenplay. But he right. was, um, you know, he was a very young man at the time. Right. As were as as was I. I mean, I was 19. My guess is Chris is probably about 24, maybe 25 years old when he wrote Gremlins. So he was kind of like uh, my recollection of him was. Uh, he was kind of like this. He, his whole kind of vibe was like this. <laughs> wow, I'm here on a movie set, like with cool people and stuff's happening. This is awesome. I mean, I think he was, he was pretty blown away. I mean, I was too. I was kind of like, hey, I'm here on a movie set working with people. <laughs> this is awesome. So, I mean, I, I, I kind of felt the exact same way he did. I think he and I kind of looked at each other like, how did we do this? Right, right, right. You know, it was like that uh, Talking Heads song, Once in a Lifetime. Yes. How did I get here? I get here, that's right. And uh, so he, he was pretty blown away. I'm sure now he's got such a rich, detailed career. He's probably an old hand at it, you know <laughs> what I mean? And I, I wouldn't say he's jaded or anything like that, but right. he's, he's an experienced filmmaker, so... I, I imagine he's probably a lot more uh, calm and collected. Now, one of the things I'd like to talk to you both about too is you both had the fortune on, on especially looking at like you know, Gremlins and Gremlins 2, Poltergeist and Poltergeist 2, of working with some really amazing actors, some really great castmates there with you. Um, you know, I mean, you look at Poltergeist, you look at the whole family, you know, Craig Nelson, Joe Beth Williams. You look at, you know, with, with Gremlins, you've got, you know, Quentin Axley, you've got, you got to cameo with, with Chuck Jones, you've got Dick Miller, I mean, you've got so many wonderful people. What was it like being on those sets as young actors, you know, in this case, you know, very big deals for you all. Did, did that help you in, in, in getting the process and developing the characters and, and making it through the march to make that film? 
Well, for me, I, I was so inexperienced at that time. And like I said before, I mean, the key for me was just to be really natural. And I was very lucky because Joe Beth and Craig basically became my surrogate parents on the set. And it was so much so that we were shooting like out in Simi Valley, which is a suburb of uh, Southern California. And someone said, um, can I have an autograph of your mom? And I pointed to my real mom. And they, and they said, no, no, I meant your real mom, meaning Joe Beth. Because she looked so, and I think that was very telling because she was so maternal and so warm and kind. And sometimes I didn't know what to do. I mean, you, a film is shot entirely and completely out of order. So all of a sudden, you could be in a moment in the middle of the movie where you have to be screaming at the top of your lungs, you're terrified of something, and you have nothing to reference it. And I was like, I asked Joe Beth, I said, what do I do? I don't, I don't know how many get to this point. And she gave me exercises, and we talk about the scene together, like a mom would, and said, this is what we're doing, Oliver, and this is what's happening. And she, and sometimes, you know, even on the sequel, I, I didn't, some of the lines weren't that great, honestly. Um, and I didn't know how to say them, and so we talk about the lines a little bit. And she helped me understand what I was really saying. And Craig was so laid back and mellow, and no matter what was going on, I mean, there were a lot of crazy, chaotic things that were going on on that set. But I always made a joke, and he always made the feeling very lighthearted. So when you have family members like that, you know, your surrogate family members, it, it really made an enjoyable experience. And I had a great rapport with Heather and Dominique too. I mean, Dominique was so talented and so laid back and a constant professional too. And Heather was so precocious and a kind, sweet little girl. Um, and we were truly like, you know, brother and sister. We hung out after the movie actually finished shooting too, like a brother and sister would. Um, so. That whole vibe is why I think that transmitted into the movie and why it feels the way it is because we really were truly a family. I just realized kind of an interesting coincidence with you and me linking, uh, linking us together even further than just a little Spielberg early 80s thing is that after Poltergeist, Heather O'Rourke uh, did a TV movie with me oh, wow, wow. called Surviving Family in Crisis. She played my sister in it. And I played my brother was River Phoenix, the late great River Phoenix. So what's odd is the people who played your brother and sister both died young, somewhat tragically. And then I did a movie with Heather and another per actor, and they both died young, kind of tragically. So we both did movies where there are two siblings are no longer with us, which is kind of like, what are the odds of that happening? Especially since one of them was the same one. Yeah, yeah that is a right. strange coincidence. That is. Yeah. That's very odd. Um, yeah. What was the question? Just looking at the, the, the cast that you got to work with on that, and I mean, you've got so many wonderful, talented people, and for you it was a, a, a new experience. So what was it like working with that cast? Did that kind of help you through the, the, the rigors of making this film and you know that, that whole experience? That, well, one of the things that was interesting was that Joe Dante, the director, is such an unbelievable film buff. I mean, he's like one of those guys who's seen 40,000 movies or something like that and has incredible retention for names and dates and actors and everything like that. So I didn't really appreciate a lot of the character actors that I worked with at the time. Like, I just didn't really know who they were. Like, I had no idea who Scott Brady was, who plays the sheriff. Yep. Then as I got older, I saw him in great movies like Johnny Guitar and, and things like that. Harry Andrews, you know, and all of the John Ford movies. The guys in The Searchers with yep. John Wayne. I mean, it's just okay. incredible. William Schaller just passed away. All of these little kind of, you know, these small parts were filled with really, really excellent character actors. No idea who Dick Miller was when I was working with him. I mean, I kind of found out along the way um, the great Asian actor Key Luke, yes. who played Mr. Wing uh, in the film. He was absolutely tremendous. Um, just a great guy to work with. And it just, it just Joe Dante was very thorough uh, with the casting all the way down the ways. And actually, I, I kind of revealed this last night, the little fun thing that we were doing. Uh, we were doing playing win, lose, or lose, or draw until about midnight last night. But, <laughs> yeah. but Hoyt Axton, who played my dad, who was a country and western singer and was terrific, was actually, um, he, wasn't supposed, he wasn't the first choice playing my dad. The guy who was the first choice to play my dad is a Hollywood legend, but he was unavailable at the time he was shooting another movie, but it was supposed to be Dick Van Dyke. 
oh, wow. was supposed to play my dad at Gremlins, but he, he, he had scheduling problems, oh, couldn't man. do it. Wow. But if you stop and think about Dick Van Dyke as my dad, what a kind of interesting different casting choice that would have made and what what I think his presence might have might have altered the movie almost have, in, yeah. in terms of tone because he's such a kind of a powerful on screen yeah. presence. So so there you go. I mean the casting is 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 a big part of it and I think Joe did a great job of kind of going another way and finding just a kind of laid back, folksy um, you know, Hoyt Axon kind of said exactly what you said, Oliver, which is he said, I'm not much of an actor, but I'm good at being myself on screen. And if you, it, it, uh, the character he plays in Gremlins is exactly who he was. I mean, there is, it, that, that's him. That's, it, there's no acting allowed with him. He's just supernatural. He, he would take some of the dialogue, too, and make it kind of fit his Oklahoma speech pattern a little yep. bit better. So he, he would say things like, now the three rules, now I, I'm just gonna tell you right now what the three rules are, so y'all pay attention now. So rule number one is that, and none, none of that was in the script. That was just, like if I had, that was him saying, if I had to say three rules to you, this is how I'd say it. That's how I'd say it, right. So he just made everything work for him. And that's why his performance seems, you could argue his performance is maybe the most effortless performance in the whole movie. It's very uh, genuine, it really yeah. is. We have a question in front. Yeah. Remake, well, I'm kind of torn about remakes. You know, I think everything should be reinvented, and I think nothing is really sacred. And every in film itself, every movie builds on itself. But I think if you are going to do a remake, reinvent it, bring something new to it. Don't shoot it shot for shot or sling together the scenes that made the film special. And if you're going to do a remake, treat it as something precious, something that's important to you. And that was the thing about the Poltergeist remake is I felt like they really missed what made that film really work. Yeah, I have to see it. Yeah, and I mean the key thing about Poltergeist that makes the engine and why that film has lasted as long as it had and separates itself from a traditional horror film is the family unit. The love, the people who truly love that family. You're rooting for them. I mean, you know, if you watch that film, it's the first 30 minutes are really not that many special effects. Yeah, def I watched it and I didn't realize, I guess, how good it was. <laughs> I, I saw a, a last year for the first time on the big screen um, again. And, you know, and that, that's what really came to me is how great those scenes hold up. The special effects are a little weak, they're of the day, and they worked at the time. But the family scenes, 50 years from you're going to watch that movie again, and they're still going to play. And I think that's, going back to your question about the remake, I mean, I think that's what they really lost in the remake. You have no chemistry between all these very fine actors. And it's a very fast 15 minutes where they set everything up. So you really don't care about these people. And then they throw in a lot of CGI effects, which... On their own, they really do nothing because, you know, Stephen, you know, before I went to film school, I asked him, what, what is the secret to filmmaking? And he told me, he said, he said this key thing, he said, compassion will always win over camera. Meaning, you can have amazing special effects and all the technology, but at the end of the day, what the audience is rooting for are great characters and the relationship between those characters. And Stephen wrote this original draft of the script. Um, so he understood that very well. And you watch Jaws and Raiders and all these movies, you know, that's why we love, we love those characters. And I think we've gotten lost sight of that, in, you know, in some of these remakes and even movies that aren't remakes. Yeah, I've noticed a lot of remakes, the characters are kind of dull, maybe. A lot of movies and TV shows, like, I usually like the characters. Right. Like, I kind of look at that stuff myself because I'm also an actor, mm -hmm. you know, I'm to be one, so it's like, I'm like to a theater major, I just graduated yeah. back in May, and, Thank you. But yeah, like that's just something I think about usually with movies or TV shows where people basically have to play a family, mm -hmm. you know. But yeah, like it would help them, you know, if they're actually hanging out and you know, you know, becoming best friends. Like that actually shows on screen. Yeah, it, it completely does. And because you know, I think the camera is like a lie detector. It can tell when you're lying. You know, every you have to be true, or you have to be an incredibly good liar. You know. And I think you're right. I mean, that's the best thing. I mean, a lot, you want to be able to hang out with your co-stars and develop that rapport because it really does show on screen for the most part, I think. 
you want to chime in? Well, you don't have to worry about a Gremlins remake because Christopher Col Chris Columbus has the has the rights, and he he said the first Gremlins is. It is to his mind a, a near a near perfect film, and as long as he's alive, they'll never he'll never ever allow uh, a Gremlins remake to be made ever. So that bad boy will sit there nice and untouched, probably for the rest of most of your lifetime. <laughs> um, but they are they are working on pretty hard on a Gremlins three. Oh. That, that I know for sure. That's awesome. Um, so we'll see what comes of that. They're still in the writing process, and that could take. A, quite a while, sure. so we'll, we'll we'll see what happens to that because you know every good movie comes from a good script. So absolutely, they better get a good script, otherwise it won't be good. Absolutely. Question. This will be our last question, I believe. We're going to wrap up, so please ask away. Well, hopefully you guys have some fun with this one. Um, what's your favorite Gremlins movie? Uh, Gremlins two. Gremlins two. Yeah. 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 I guess I'll, I, have no, I would never turn on a roll when I was a kid. I would take anything that was given to me, pretty much, for the most part. But I did lose out on a lot of, I mean, the roles I did lose out on, and I came really close because even if you're experienced, you have to get used to rejection. And it's just, you know, when you're acting, you really just can't take it personally. It's really nothing to do with you, no matter how great a performance. I mean, I was up for Doogie Howser, I remember. Wow. Yeah, it was between me and Neil Patrick Harris and some other gentlemen. And uh, yeah, we read and did our like screen test and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I didn't get the part, you know. But you know, it had nothing to do with me. It's always about uh, what they're looking for and how you work within the whole groove of the, all the chemistry of all the other actors. Well, it's kind of like what Zach you know, tried to if, if Dick Van Dyke would have been in the role of Rand Peltzer, it probably would have changed how they would have cast that film. It's a valid point. Yeah, so Zach, you know, chime in on that because it's, it's definitely you know, interesting to, to hear your all's perspective on this with what all you've had. You know, well, I never turn. I really hardly ever turn anything down unless it's really unless the script is just so dreadful and the budget seems so low that you know, or my paycheck is so low that the whole thing is just kind of really a bad script. You know, low budget, no paycheck. Like really, I, I don't really. I'd rather kind of sit at home on the couch with my cats. Um, but I will say, like. There are probably only three or four things that I've ever come close, really, really close to getting, that I sit around every now and then and go, wow, you know, if only I had gotten that, that would have helped me. And I'm sure you probably wouldn't know what they are. So, um, I got the part of Alex P. Keaton in Family Ties, the Mike J. Fox role. I was doing something else at the time, couldn't do it. So that, you kind of look at that seven year paycheck millions and millions and millions of dollars. That kind of is a little brutal. That you, I was working on something, you know, paid you like a grand for two weeks or something like that. So that's just, that's just the way it goes. But I would say the three movies that I sort of sit around going, wow, that would have been nice, are probably St. Elmo's Fire, Platoon, Charlie Sheen part, and The Rocketeer. Those are probably the three movies that I came super close to and didn't get, and you go, wow, I kind of wish I got that. Oh, and Back to the Future, but I didn't really get that close to Back to the Future. I mean, I read for it, but I didn't really, I, don't, I didn't really feel like I got like, close <laughs> up the, the way. I thought for sure I was going to get St. Elmo's Fire. I mean, the director basically practically told me after the screen test, and then something weird happened along the way, and it just, it just didn't happen, which happens politically. Right, Oliver, I'm sure you know. you're, just, you're just like 99% sure you get it, and then something goes wrong, and you're like, how did I not get that? Yeah. So, you know, I mean, but you, I've probably gone up for thousands of things, so the fact that you only have two or three or four regrets like that, it's not that big a deal. It's not just part of the business, you know, you win some, you lose some. Well, folks, thank you all very much. And again, thanks so much to Zach and Oliver. Thank you so much for the time this afternoon. Really great to be here. Aren't we going to see you tomorrow, too? Yeah. Same bad team tomorrow. So Same bad channel.